Thank you. 
Let us pray. God of every land and the nation, you have created all people, and you dwell among us, Jesus Christ. Listen to the cries of those who pray to you, and grant as you would flame to the greatness of your name. All people will know your power, love, and work in the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray to share the word of God from Isaiah, the 61st chapter. The word picked up by Jesus as he shares his first sermon. First we pray. Lord, gather us, nurture us, feed us, inspire us with the gift of your word. May we be strengthened, may we be drawn closer to you. May we know again your gift of abundant life and the promise of eternal life. In Christ we pray. Amen. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, to the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, and that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. This is the word of our Lord. And we proclaim this word as we find it in the 19th Psalm, number 750. We will share responsibly claiming this word, and we will share and sing the first response, which we will hear from our choir.
is a great reward.
told the boiler was all. Uh, it has come on, which is, I guess, why we're here. The boys, the West, is going to turn it off. Thank you, Wes, for your service. Love the boys.
the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 through 38. Hear the word of God. And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And he went to the synagogue, as his custom was, on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And there was given to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. He opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here also in your own country. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his own country. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when there came a great famine over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and put him out of the city, led him to the brow of the hill from which their city was built, that they might throw him down headlong. Passing through the midst of them, he went away. This is the word of our Lord. Well, I do not know how flattering it is for me to state that my experience with my first sermon is an experience far different from that of Jesus. This is true despite the fact I have preached several first sermons, having served at several churches. Generally speaking, the first sermon I have preached at each church has been graciously received. This is true of First Church here. I fondly remember your kind welcome and gracious affirmation of my first sermon. Thank you. Now you would think this positive experience of the first sermon is Jesus' experience. It is true, initially, his is a positive experience. Jesus is known by this crowd. We are told he took up and read the scroll, as was his custom. He reads from the prophet Isaiah, one of the servant passages. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus rolls up the scroll, hands it to the attendant, sits down. All eyes fixed on him, Jesus says, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So to this point, Jesus' first sermon goes well. If only Jesus stopped here. But we notice Jesus does not stop here because he cannot stop here and be faithful to what God has sent him to do. You see, what Jesus does with this first sermon is preach his I have a dream sermon. What I mean is this is a sermon in which Jesus, like Martin Luther King Jr. many years later, cast his grand vision for God's future. Jesus, with his initial sermon, sets out the vision for his ministry, 
declares the course his ministry shall take. Well, I've heard other clergy state, a pastor's first sermon should be such an I have a dream sermon. This is an opportune time to declare your vision for ministry, they say. Plus, everyone's going to be here that first Sunday to hear the new pastor. You may never see these people again. So we see Jesus preaching his I have a dream sermon. It's to a point, all is well. But Jesus hasn't finished. He goes on to tell of God's prophet Elijah caring for a widow in the land of Zarephath. He tells of God's prophet Elisha healing a leper from the land of Syria. And we notice nobody says amen. Far from it. The truth is, this, this angry response to Jesus from those in the synagogue in Nazareth that day is puzzling. I say this because Jesus preaches from their minds. He preaches scripture they know, scripture they have been taught. That is to say, Jesus is not standing before those in the synagogue voicing his opinions. Jesus is not giving instruction. He is not telling them what they should do. He simply shares from what all agree is the word of from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17. When Elijah was prophet of God, there was great famine among God's people. Yet amongst all these people, Elijah is sent to minister to no one except a widow in the distant land of Zarephath. From the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5. When Elijah was prophet of God, there was a great outbreak of leprosy throughout the land. Yet Elisha was sent by the Lord to cure no one except Naaman, a soldier from the foreign land, Syria. Two passages from the Bible. No opinions from Jesus, no instructions, just the word of God again. Why do the people in the synagogue that day respond to Jesus as they do? Why, as the scripture tells us, are they filled with wrath? Why do they rise up? Put Jesus out of the city, leading him to the brow of a hill that they might throw him down headlong. He's preaching the Word of God. Preaching from their Bible. So why not rejoice? Why not respond to the Word of God with thanks be to God? Well, could it be there are those things we love in theory, but despise in practice? My first appointment as a pastor was to serve two churches in the northern neck of Virginia, where the Potomac River runs into the Chesapeake Bay. While I was pastor there, the bishop of the Virginia Conference, Robert Blackburn, initiated a program by which he hoped to launch new churches throughout the conference. To promote this initiative, a pulpit exchange was Established. This meant that on a certain Sunday, pastors would exchange pulpits, would preach in each other's church. The rationale being this would be a great opportunity for those of the churches finally to hear someone other than their own preacher. So the designated Sunday arrived. As assigned by my district superintendent, I traveled to nearby Galilee Church to worship. To encourage the faithful to support the bishop's plan 
build new churches. I remember my time at Galilee Church fondly. The congregation was welcoming, friendly, supportive. At the same time, the pastor of Galilee Church, the Reverend Bernal Francis Johnson, traveled to the churches I served to lead worship and lend her support to the bishop's initiative. At one of my churches, the Reverend Johnson received a friendly call. But following the conclusion of worship at that church, as she drove to the other church I served, she would pass by cars leaving that church after Sunday school. Cars driven by those who would not think of staying for a service of worship led by a black woman. Now no doubt those in that church would say, God loves everyone. No doubt they had sung many times, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. No doubt those in the church had read, had heard these words of Scripture, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Could it be there are those things wonderful in theory, but offensive in practice? Is that the problem with Jesus' first sermon in Nazareth? Again, Jesus was not preaching scripture the faithful did not know. He was not trying to be clever. He was not trying to be contemporary or hip. He's being faithful in every way, affirming the Sabbath, affirming the synagogue, affirming Scripture. And the response to all of this, kill the preacher. But he is doing what any pastoral search committee, any pulpit committee, any staff parish relations committee would say they desire. He's preaching the Bible. Maybe that's the problem. Because of many truths to which the Bible witnesses, it offers these truths. God sent Jesus to seek and save the outsider. God forgives the sinner 70 times 7. God seeks those who need healing not those who are already well. And there is also this. Not only does God tell us to love our enemies, God already loves our enemies. Not only does God tell us to pray for those who persecute us, God, by His Spirit, prays for those who persecute us. A troubling and disturbing God, this God to which the Word of God witnesses. A troubling God before us this morning, a God so extravagant with His grace. Luke, the evangelist who alone tells us of Jesus' first sermon being a near-death experience, appears especially sensitive to this prodigal grace of God of how such grace is without boundary or condition, how such grace relentlessly reaches to draw all within its embrace. You see, it's Luke who tells us there were two men who went to the temple to pray. One of these men was a, a publican, a tax collector, understood to be an enemy of the people, a social outcast. The other man, a Pharisee, a reputable man, a man contributing much to the social order, a man more than welcome in any of our churches. Yet Luke tells us God sees, God chooses differently than we do. God looks with favor upon the social outcast, the public and the past. It's Luke who tells us when a certain traveler was nearly killed, as he traveled from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's not the respectable priest who treats the traveler appropriately. 
It's not the good and faithful Levite. Instead, according to Luke, the one who shows behavior that is pleasing to God to this half-dead traveler is a man with whom decent people dare not associate, a hated Samaritan. It's Luke who tells us when the younger son of a certain father runs off and wastes the inheritance the father is given that when this son returns, rather than condemn him with finger-pointing fury, the father does what? Throws the most extravagant of parties. Of course, not everyone, such as us older brother types, is happy with the greatest behavior of his father. Luke is far from finished witnessing boundless grace of God, a grace shown to the widow of the foreign nation of Zarephath, to Naaman, a soldier from distant Syria. For Luke tells not only the ministry of Jesus, he tells of the ministry of those who follow Jesus, following his ascension into heaven. You see, Luke gives to us the book of Acts. And in that writing, Luke continues with this witness to this language defying grace of God. Luke tells of a unit far from the ends of the earth, a man who, according to Scripture, has no business among the people of God. But a unit who nonetheless is baptized by an apostle of Jesus named Philip. Then at a church conference in Jerusalem, following a vision in which God tells the apostle Peter three times, don't call unclean what I declare be clean. It's then the church of the risen Christ declares Gentiles, non Jews, are as welcome among the people of God as anyone else. Period. You know, when I first came to know, love of God, when I first came to experience God's love through His saints, through those within this body of Christ, I thought, how wonderful is this grace of God? How wonderful is this unmerited love and favor? How wonderful it is that despite all my unworthiness, I met What I would be slower to discover is that the same grace of God, a grace I so gladly declared to be so wonderful, is a grace I would also discover to be quite offensive. Those people in the synagogue that Sabbath, those hearing Jesus' first sermon, are quicker to discover the offense of the grace of God than I. You see, we may believe the grace of God and to be a wonderful thing when it's shown to us. But when that same grace is shown to those unlike us, to those we see as enemies, when we discover God loves these outsiders as much as God loves us, it may be too much to bear. It may be so offensive we wish to kill the one who would tell us so. This is the problem for these worshipers in the synagogue that Sabbath. Accepting the news that God loves these outsiders, the widow in Zarephath, the Syrian soldier, just as much as he loves us. Offensive news that God loves these outsiders. And as tempting as we may find it to be, I'm not going to fuss at these gathered in the synagogue that Sabbath. I'm not convinced they are so different from you and me. I only wish they knew this, because I hope you and I know this. We are all outsiders. Not a one of us is entitled to the love of God. Not one of us here this morning is deserving of the favor of God. None of us 
regardless of wealth, prestige, accomplishment, name, is entitled to the grace of God any more than anyone else. None of us deserves it, none of us earns it, but God gives it to all of us. Foreign widows, foreign soldiers, those not of the covenant, outsiders, all of us. Because the Lord has anointed them to bring the tidings to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to open the prison of those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor to all of us, outsiders. We respond to the word as we affirm our scripture from 1 Timothy number 889. Let us stand. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom.
to a God as we pray. Being those who ask, seek, not in those who pray without ceasing. As we share in our time of prayer, uh, I will lift up our Bishop Sharma Lewis in prayer. Bishop Lewis had hip surgery late last year, has had some complications from that surgery, uh, and again had that surgery this past Friday. in this time of prayer. Uh, it is a pattern of prayer in which we will share various petitions, and I will conclude each of these petitions with the words, Lord, in your mercy, invite your response, hear our prayer, invite you to speak those prayers that you will let offer at this time. Then we pray, as Christ has taught us, let us pray. Here's as we pray for the concerns of this community. Lord, in your mercy. Here's Lord, as we pray for your world, its peoples, and its leaders. Lord, in your mercy. Here's to pray for your church, its leaders, its members, and its mission. Lord, in your mercy. For Bishop Lewis, Jimmy Howard, the ministers of First Church.
God loves us with a love that will not let us go. Because God nourishes us, sustains us each day by His Spirit. And now we go forth, sent by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>